Today is the executive director of the San Francisco Center for the Book, Jeff Thomas, and I have a long history with them. Not really long. Actually, I have a long history as far as like a long time ago, but I did my master's thesis at the Center for the Book in San Francisco. I did a polymer plate book production and used their Vandercook presses. I absolutely love this place. And I hope that you love this place and everything that Jeff is all about and gain a better appreciation for the book arts. The Wise Fool with me, Matthew Doles, as your host, is supported in part by an EEA grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway in an effort to work together for a green, competitive, and inclusive Europe. We would like to th also thank our partners Hunt Kastner in Prague, Czech Republic and Kunstcentrene i Norge in Norway. Links to EEA grants and our partner organizations are available in the show notes. Could you please pronounce your name correctly for me? Jack Thomas. You are the executive director of the San Francisco Center for the Book, mm -hmm. correct? And yes. now how long have you been there? I started there in the fall of 2012. Prior to that, you were in the business world, we'll call it versus nonprofit world, right? Do, and doing what? I had a stint at a nonprofit before that, but yeah, I worked in finance for the bulk of, you know, post-college up until about the age of 40. I was in, I was working in finance and yeah, it was it was fine. <laughs> I worked I worked in Boston on a trading floor for a number of years and then I moved out to California and worked in public finance, the bond market. I was a credit analyst for for Moody's for many years. I think if there was going to be a kind of niche in the finance world where I was somewhat happy, it was it was there because it was primarily People who had done political science degrees, liberal, liberal arts degrees, and who were very interested in the workings of government. And so this was helping governments raise money to, to do their projects. But the issue was that who, who invests in, in municipal bonds? It's very wealthy people or institutions who we never see. So I was writing these really dry reports on, you know, the credit quality of a sewer district for wealthy people who wanted a safe investment. So, you know, it was interesting. I like to do, I like to learn things. I like to kind of just dive in and figure them out like they're puzzles. And certainly finance was something that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not so much a numbers person, but there was, I'm enough to find it interesting. And so there was certainly plenty to learn there. But once I'd done that, I just I remember sitting at my desk and seeing like the years of deals coming across my desk that I just did the same thing over and over again. And it started to really get to me. Yeah. So I, I it kind of it took a long time for me to really take the leap. And in fact, I, I ended up just saying, I don't know what I'm doing next. I'm done. I'm taken. Um, thanks, everyone. I'll see you later and took a couple of years off and in that time sort of made the decision that you know I was gonna it, working for some sort of arts nonprofit was the way to to go or at least it it's the thing that appealed to me and I just was trying to build relationships and connect with people so that's kind of how I made that initial shift away from that world well, like I always joke that artists get into being artists because they don't have a business mind. Like they're they're just not good with business. So I'm I'm wondering because you come from a business background, does that actually benefit you? So ha did all your years of being in a, a business industry is that helping run a nonprofit? Yes, I I think so. I mean, I don't think anyone 
can do it. Not that I'm like special, but you know, I think that you certainly have to have a genuine interest in what you're going into. I mean, that was a bit of the issue when I first, the first nonprofit I worked for was a was an orchestra. You know, I grew up with playing instruments and was introduced to classical music, but I never really was no, you know, it was interesting, pleasant, no pleasant, no passion. Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite words when it comes to careers. It's like fucking passion. Sorry. Oh, you you're welcome to cuss like a sailor. It's perfectly okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah, I have issues with the word passion, but it could just because it's a distraction. So I was not, I just was not bought in bought into that. But I was really, it was a period of learning. So yeah, you know, it's it's funny you you come into a nonprofit, and I think that there is a way having having been fully immersed in corporate culture for an extended period of time, and how you approach things in almost a business, not in the money, but in the sort of attitude of approaching of the way you approach things and authority and rules and regulations. I mean, frankly, the most eye-opening thing about working in finance was this moment where I thought, oh my God, this is all, they're just making it up as they go along it's all made up and it's all an agreement and so they can just do whatever they want and if people go along with it you know or it works it's like right on so that was really eye-opening for me and sort of changed the way i thought about things i mean not 100 percent, but it certainly influenced me so coming into a nonprofit, i was really much you know running meetings and having agendas and you know, sort of toning down the emotion of meetings and trying to get things to get things done was 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 helpful because you know I I think that nonprofits, not all of them, but they can trend to be a little time consuming in a way that doesn't it doesn't need to be time time consuming I guess. So you know that helped me to kind of just bring something to the organization that might not have been there. You know, the organization doesn't have to be that, but it, having that sort of influence can make some things happen. So I think that really helped. I think there was this attitude of, you know, it's like, yeah, those are the rules, but we can do whatever we want. I mean, that I brought over and I think sort of freed people up to think different to say, oh, yeah, we were doing it this way, but we don't necessarily have to continue doing it that way. Not that you want to change everything all the time, but, you know, it, it frees you up. And also, you know, frankly, a bit of, I don't know if aloofness is the right word, but to sort of sometimes aloofness can sort of grease the wheels. You don't get caught up on in certain things. And so I think it did prepare me in those ways. That being said, I mean, I did what drew me to the Center for the Book, part among other things, was I had this choice of do I want to go bigger organizationally and specialize in what I wanted to do? Or do I want to go smaller or stay the same? Because it was a largest orchestra. Or for smaller and be more of a jack of all trades, really get into the detail of what was going on in the day to day. I just really felt like I want to go s- smaller. I really like, like I said before, learning a lot of things and just figuring out th- how things work. And so that was that was an appeal. And I'd done, I'd done that sort of specialized, large organization type of thing. I yeah, thought in where, where you're just on a subcommittee of a subcommittee that just does one single part of the entire industry exactly. of it all kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Or you're a director that so has all the people under you are, are doing it, doing the work, and you're just sort of managing and doing vision work and, and stuff. Oh, sure. My my father's a priest, a reverend. I don't know what the right term is. I'm, I'm so bad with that. But he and I remember being a kid and they would have their like what they call vestry meetings, which is basically mm-hmm. the, the the board of directors basically of that church. 
and they would get such heated arguments over the stupidest things. Like, I mean, I remember one argument that went on, it went on for multiple meetings. Like, I think it was like whether to put like asphalt or concrete down for like the, the, some paved area. And I'm, and they were just like at each other's throat over whether, which one, and I'm, I mean, the passion is great. That's lovely. But like, yeah. there's a line where like, you do have to sort of just say, it's just asphalt. Like, come on. Yeah. 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 I mean, that crops up in a, in a, in a lot of places, but I think it, it's especially fertile ground for that to arise <laughs> in those settings. Cause I mean, you have people who were, who've, who kind of, their careers were all in, in nonprofits or they were artists who wanted to do something that was a little steadier work or enjoyed it for some, for some reason. So they wouldn't have that kind of more formal corporate experience. I ran the nonprofit. I told you this before we recorded, but I'll say it for the listeners. Like I ran a nonprofit and I did a piss poor job at it. It was absolutely horrible. I went in with all the passion in the world, but with zero concept of what running a nonprofit actually means because only like it took me 10 years to figure it out. And I literally like figured it out in the last six months before I finally just like said, fuck it, I'm out. Yeah. Because it, I mean, it's, it's all about finding like-minded people. I mean, it, it, a nonprofit is really about building a tribe of people that support and will um, promote or, and, or invest, whether it's time, money, resources, whatever in the, the idea and the motivation and the mission of that nonprofit. It's not right. just have a thing sell the thing, you know, like run a workshop, earn the money, you know, have a facility, have people come in and use it. I mean, there's so much more to a nonprofit than there is to a for-profit business. Right. Yeah. And the, the, the board model, board of directors model for a nonprofit, you know, is nothing like a corporate board model. And to me, that was, that was probably the biggest cultural organizational cultural element that was just so foreign to me when I when I walked into a nonprofit was was working with the board, working with board members, working on committees, understanding how committees work, who, you know, how, you know, because there's so things are so different from nonprofit to nonprofit as well. I mean, there's a loose structure of things, but depending on the size and type of organization, the committee structures are very different. Of course, changing one board member changes the culture of a board. So that to have something that is so changeable and it, it kind of is probably the biggest presence in certainly in the executive director's life is the the board relationship and you know it's in in a lot of ways currently i have just i'm pretty much always at the center of had a fantastic board but it can be horrible i mean it can really be horrible and one person can just sort of take over any everything and yeah the horror stories i've i've heard so yeah and that was that was really the biggest thing and of course dealing with donors and fundraising initially when i decided to start to try working for non nonprofits i said i don't want to do finance because i did that and it's too reminiscent of what i was what i was doing i'm just i couldn't imagine doing marketing because i'm not just not that type of person and i thought well i mean those those are the three those you either you're either doing finance some sort of marketing communications or fundraising or the program the, the actual program work so I said, well, it can't hurt to learn fundraising, so that's what I that's what I did, and yeah, that was that was that was eye opening. That's really, I mean, that's schmoozing is really all that is. Like, it's really like because when even when I ran my nonprofit, well, I mean, I can go back to 
I remember my dad basically trying to schmooze, sounds really bad when I say it like that, but like schmooze people to basically give money to the church. But in the same way, I had to try and schmooze people to give money. I mean, the hardest part is like you can work and work and work and work and you can be best friends with these people. You can hang out with them all the time. You could do everything. And in the end, it's it's up until that last minute when they actually write the check. Like, And until that, like, it's yeah. really hard. It's very emotionally draining because like you're so scared the whole time that like you might say one thing wrong and all of a sudden they're like nope not giving you money anymore and you're like what did i say wrong i don't even know what i said wrong oh yeah i'll say that the donors in the book arts world are are very different than the donors i experienced in the orchestra world which were very more I don't know if old school is the right word, but philanthropy, people did it because it was this a bit of a status thing and had m many more expectations. Whereas on the book art side, you know, I feel like people just love this whole book arts thing. They really want to support it. You know, they love the organization and are willing to give. So that's made... I think that's made the process a lot easier for me. Of course, it's pretty rare that someone actually loves asking for money. I think what is, most people are pretty scared of it and executive directors, development directors, board members, when it comes down to it, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable. And I think it's taken me time to, change my thinking about it and realizing what it is, is really relationship building and knowing what it is that the donors are interested in. So I think shifting from focusing on these one-on-one -on -one relationships, whether or not you're going to be asking them for money for a specific thing is more doable more manageable it seems easier than having to like sit down and, and ask for money because once you've done that it's a little easier to say hey you know mike for working on this project is that something you'd be interested in it's a lot easier to do that than something that feels more like a cold call but you know i'm also this organization is very different than a, a larger organization so that doesn't speak to what development is everywhere one of the things that I've noticed about nonprofit industries, sort of even NGOs in, in Europe and other places, it's insanely easy. Okay, I shouldn't say easy, but it's it's relatively easy to find money for programs, events, special things, all this kind of stuff. But it's very difficult to find funding for operating costs. Like just mm -hmm. that that's everybody everybody loves to you know grants are great with programs and and events and things like that but they grants will not give money to operating costs and same thing yeah. even with donors and stuff like this it's very hard to find people that will basically just support keeping the doors open yep no i think that i think that's true i think during the the pandemic there's been a push i, I started an executive directors group of small to medium-sized arts nonprofits and mostly in san francisco and once the pandemic hit we were we went from being like there was like 18 people in the group to now there are like 38 and we meet we were meeting weekly but now we're meeting every other week so i was more tapped into the general visual art scene in san francisco and the bay area and certainly the funding related related to that. And there's very little general operating funding available except for Grants for the Arts, which is a, a city and county support from their hotel tax fund. So there was this push. People felt like there was this moment of saying, look, foundations are making it so onerous to apply for and use funding and really controlling how organizations are using their funding versus trusting the organizations to use it wisely 
and use it in the way that they need and not have the process of applying for funding be basically a, for many places at least a half-time job so yeah it's you know i think that there's been more of a shift more of a general shift in that to provide general operating funding but you know i wonder how long it'll last and we'll, we'll see i mean i haven't we, we don't get a lot of foundation funding so i i don't have that much experience in that but we'll see if it stays that way or continues to head in that direction Okay, well, we jumped ahead a whole bunch of things. Let's go back a step for the listeners yeah. who may not know anything about the Center for the Book. Could you give like a little overview of what you all are? Yeah, the Center was founded by Mary Austin and Kathleen Birch back in 1996. And it really started, they were both had been printers and worked in the book arts and printing and various forms before that, and they were both very interested in artist books, contemporary contemporary artists who were using the book form as their, their medium. And there were a lot of organizations that supported book art and artist books, but there was very little in the way of brick and mortar spaces that was showing this work. So it started really as a gallery or exhibition space to show this work. And we can talk about artists' books later or whenever, because it's a it's a bit of a complicated topic, but that was their goal was to show this, to show, and they had to be contemporary artists, living artists who were producing new work and getting this medium in front of people. So that's how it started. Eventually they had sort of developed the idea of starting to offer classes as a way to fund the exhibition program. And then the workshop program became really kind of its own sort of successful thing. So they kind of grew up along next to each other. We've been in three locations in the Potrero Hill neighborhood of San Francisco, all on the same block, which has been very easy-ish for, for moving, except for all the presses that we have. I mean, we do right now, our schedule is three to four major exhibitions a year. When we were doing in-person classes, we were doing between or like 350 classes a year to a couple of thousand students in letterpress printing, book binding, some paper making, some calligraphy. We have quite an array of presses in our print studio. And so some of it is we train people on those presses so that they can then come in and use them for their own work. We have a fairly substantial bindery and exhibition space. And then also in pretty active, just general events schedule where we're talking about artists, having artists come in and having celebrating exhibitions. And we have a big street festival every year called Roadworks where we have a antique steamroller brought down from Willits in Northern California and print three foot by three foot linoleum blocks on the street with a bunch of vendors every year and that's some of some people really just know us for roadworks we'll be celebrating our 15th year of that so yeah i mean it's a pretty uh, pretty substantial these are substantial programs we're celebrating our 25th year we were started we opened on a blue moon july 30th in 1996 and so we'll be having a celebration uh, one of a number of celebrations at the end of july but that's kind of a rough overview of the programming and but you also have imprint publications yeah that has it, it's varied we had a larger artist in residence program in the aughts late aughts that the, the goal was to bring in contemporary artists who had not worked in the book form to come up with a concept of an artist's book and then with a team of volunteers produce that book. And we had some beautiful work came out of that. In fact, you can see some of it still, and it was an addition. So I actually, it's interesting. I can't exactly remember what the addition, they may have varied from piece to piece, but so those were 
really fine works of art and they were priced as such. So, you know, they ranged from, you know, 500 up to $2,000 per book. We then, we had a, had a parallel program called Small Plates, also kind of an artist in residence program where we would invite artists to submit ideas for books that were four inches by four inches and had to be that was the one requirement and we were going to sell them for $44 and it had to be an, an, an addition of a hundred. We had funding. So we would pay the artists to offset their materials costs. And then they would be able to keep up a, a portion of the addition and we would, we would keep the rest. And this sort of fits into one of our missions, which is to try to support production of new work, but also support artists and craftspeople who are working in the book arts. So the, the small plate still continues. We've been doing roughly three editions a year, and it's everything from a very almost fine press little bookbinding book to sort of like an origami Chinese sewing box sent down from aliens filled with things that they picked up on a visit to Earth you know, tucked in little origami enclosures inside. It's been a, a fun way to an, engage with artists and have them working in our space and creating new work. I'm now interested to go back on the thing we pinned, which is the definition of an artist's book. Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> They're extraordinary. I think the difficult thing, people who've never experienced artist books, is that there's a lot in the way of being able to really comprehend what it what it is. I think people think of a couple things. They think of altered books where you're taking an existing book and cutting it up or making it into something out, carving it, creating some sort of structure out of it. I mean, that's its own thing and certainly part of the book arts world, but that's an artist's book is something different. And I'm going to do a little disclaimer here because it is somewhat complicated. There is disagreement on the scene in terms of language definitions and actual words and apostrophe usage when it comes to artists' books that I'm not an expert. And I have been immersed in this for about eight years. I've learned a lot and I really I believe in it, admire in it, admire it all. But I apologize in advance to all the scholars out there. But I will say, so there, there are different streams of things. There's, there's altered books. There's fine press books where you are creating an edition of some sort, some text that's largely the focus is on the fine printing and the fine binding of the, of the piece. Artist books are more along the lines of there being some sort of unique artistic content that also uses the elements of the book to convey that artistic message. So it uses not only the text, but the type, possibly the ink, the paper that's used, the structure that's used. They may have, and they may be using different levels of doing things by hand from everything down to actually making the ink themselves. But really the book structure itself is part of the artistic message. And it can range from an addition to a one of a kind book, something that has a more sort of what, what would be more viewed as a trade edition version of the book that's less expensive and less elaborate and a deluxe version of the book that is, you know, just in 17 extraordinary boxes with, you know, covered in gold, but the gold means something within the context of the message of the book. So, yeah, I think it's, I think until you actually see them and experience the variety and how artists have used all of the elements, it's strangely hard to understand what it is. And I think that's a hindrance, unfortunately, for artist books because 
people and, and the reason that Mary and Kathleen started the center is to get these books in front of people and for them to be able to touch them because in large part it's a it's a tactile experience as well unlike 2d visual arts mostly you're meant to ideally meant to hold them you know there's the white glove crowd who insists that with these fine books that you need to be have your white gloves on before you touch them and then there's the non-white glove crowd that who think you know this is a democratic thing people should be able to have it in their hands not have anything between their senses and the the feel of this book because that's part of what's being part of the message that's being conveyed i'm i'm a white glove person unless well unless you own it so like it, it pre-purchasing it uh, white gloves because it's not it's not mine but if it yeah. if i if i own it yeah no need for the white gloves that's fine <laughs> yeah i mean the center for the book is more of a non white glove type of organization not that's not to say that we ha- we don't have pieces in our exhibitions or that we don't have a a place for the type of work that you would really want to have gloves for but i i think the other thing is that certainly the the artist books that are being created are created as legitimate works of art and for the most part are being priced as such I mean, maybe even still a little bit low for for what they are but if you go to codex which is the big artist book fair international artist book fair that takes place every other year up in point richmond I mean, you're looking at books that are in the tens of thousands of dollars per book. And they're, I mean, they're just, you know, mind blowing and in the artistry of it. So maybe you'd want to put your gloves on for that type of book. Well, I mean, well, I, well see, okay, I'll caveat it too. My issue with the white glove thing is, is I like if if it's a extremely limited edition. So like like the one of the books I made was only like three. I made three, mm-hmm. and that's it. So like I would expect people to use the white glove because there are only three. Because if you screw up that one, that's right. one third of the entire production run. So like you better wear white gloves for that unless you own it. But yeah. I mean, if it, if it's a large production thing, yeah, I mean generally like people would say like well, this one is meant for interacting. And then if you love it, you can buy this other one that has not been interacted with. I totally understand that. And for that reason, like, you know, non-white glove is perfectly legitimate when large print runs are are in play. Yeah, that does, it actually reminds me of an idea that Mary Austin, one of our founders had, which was she really wanted to create an artist book library where it was a totally non white glove place and we just put books in there and people just could just go in and handle them and she tells the story i think it was someone maybe it was in the netherlands anyway they had they put it out and they were worried about you know were people taking them or stealing them because some of them were not cheap cheap <laughs> and they said no actually we the, the the collection increased because people sort of slipped in some some of pieces they had or or that they wanted to wanted people to experience so the the collection actually grew as opposed to getting depleted so yeah i think i think that there is this element again it's such a it's such a tactile experience tactile element of the experience of the artist book and I think you know when we have exhibitions, a lot of our stuff is in vitrines that have that are covered. And I mean, everybody gets it. Like you know, a lot of these books are on loan; they're maybe one of a kind, you know, and they they can be worth quite a lot of money. But at the same time, it's like this element of being removed from something that wasn't necessarily meant to have that element of being removed. But okay, wait. So, like, what's the for the again for the sort of for the listeners to sort of get keep, get up to this speed if they don't know much about artist books in general, mm-hmm. like like an artist monograph. So, like, let's say they you know they or a catalog or anything like this that's sort of mass produced or like anything you've generally seen in like a quote unquote like bookstore kind of thing is not an artist book. Correct. 
Okay, so the, so an artist book is something very, very different from pretty much what you would see in your average bookstore. Yes. Some differ if you could explain some differentiation of like what people see in bookstores versus a, the an artist book. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, I, I didn't I didn't go into. I mean, I would say that the bulk of it would be handmade. Each one would be handmade, so they would be printed, likely printed on some sort of printing press. They could be printed with with lead type. Likely they were hand hand bound, each one hand bound or constructed and and the binding could be of very different types of of binding. So they could be, I mean the the variety is just just endless from those that you know where you're sewing and gluing versus you know non-adhesive types of bindings. Some of them may make the paper themselves, depending on their capabilities. So I think it's the it's really the handcraft element to it. I, I think that that is a differentiation that would separate it from what you would find in a bookstore. There are also a number of what are called art book fairs. Printed Matter in New York. There's some fantastic fairs in New York and LA and a new one, different organization popped up here in San Francisco, but they're more of the sort of graphic design, not necessarily mass produced, but larger editions. Printed on professional manufacturing press. Yeah. And that kind of stuff. Off, yeah. Often perfect bound, which is the glue binding versus the sewing binding. And, and then of course you've got the whole zine scene, which is huge. And the other end of the the other end of the spectrum, but those aren't really artist books because there's there's zines, and I don't know. Maybe don't ask me to explain that difference. I'll try and throw out a difference on that. As in my experiences with zines, I would put a zine as using non-archival techniques on non-archival papers and non-archival you know inks and all this kind of stuff. Uh, because it's about sort of the the speed and the fun and the unknown kind of like randomness of things versus when I think of an artist book, I think very archival materials, archival processes, and very methodical and intentional kinds of practices. So yes. zines are sort of more fun and, and I, I hate to say it, but sort of like lowbrow. And I, I mean that in the nicest of ways because like I love a good zine in the same way I love a good artist book. But it's 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 practices. So specifically, I would say archival practices are very dramatically different. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's the it's the ease of production, ease of replication in a in a zine. I mean, the point is to get you know to get to get whatever it is out there in multiple copies in the easiest way. But also, there's something that is very creative and artistic. I mean, I would on the archival issue, I would add the element of for artist books that it isn't just that like the fine element certainly is a big portion of this but i think that there's a lot of people who do artist books that are more along the lines of less archival and more something that is really sort of you get into using the word crafty and it's not it's not that but it's less precious and more of a moment and that like can should be touched and should fall apart and should get you know should get smudged and you maybe is less less refined but is elaborate in the way that an artist book is elaborating and a message of the, the artist's intention so i mean i think of people who are doing collage on sort of rougher paper and it's sort of like you know maybe a more a cruder binding but that's really what the book is so I wouldn't I wouldn't just limit it to to fine archival materials. It's okay. The podcast is called The Wise Fool. I'm wrong mm -hmm. about a lot of things. No, no, no. I'm just I'm just um filling it out. Perfectly fine. Okay. Now I mean I have experiences. I actually did my master's thesis at the center for the book. I created a a, a small run book there through when I graduated from San Francisco Art Institute. I absolutely loved the place. But so one thing that I remember about you all, and of course, obviously things have changed in 20 years, that you had wood type 
lead type and the ability at that time to do polymer plates for sort Thank of you. design types. What? Yeah, polymer plates was, the, was what I was trying to come up with earlier. And yeah, so yes, polymer plates. Great. Okay. Um, are, a, I guess the question would be, are there even newer technologies? I mean, are people like 3D printing their type and this kind of stuff? Or is it, are people going back to lead type, wood type? Like, what, you know, I, I guess I'm sort of asking like, what's popular right now? Are there some newer technologies or are people going back to even older technologies? You know, that's, again, there are so many different currents running through all of this because there are so many different yeah, so many different things going on. I would so I would say in general, when the, we train people on presses, we teach them lead type. You have to love that because it's time. It's an it's next level time consuming. Put a pin in that. We'll come back to that. Yeah, which could be exactly what you want. Most people really find that they one want to have a little more flexibility in what they can do, and to just want to not spend the time setting type. The polymer plate is appealing because you get the the letterpress printing experience, but basically anything that you can you can do in InDesign, you can have made into a plate and then you can put it on the put it on the press and print it. So that certainly with the wedding invitation crowd and people who just want to do something that is that's just really not so doable with type, although you can certainly push the boundaries of what type can do. I mean, if you want to see someone who does that, look at Jessica Spring up in Oregon. But I think people will mostly use polymer plates when they're doing their printing. So that's the most common. As far as like as new things, I mean, a newer thing that is certainly has always been big in the zine scene is the risograph printer that you know that apparently it used to be the big thing for churches printing out their programs because it was cheap and you could do a bunch of them a bunch of them fast and that's hugely popular we have one that that works okay and that's very very popular and i think will probably continue to be popular 3d printing it's a good question. There's got it. There, I'm sure there's someone. There's there are people out there using 3D printing in a way that is. Oh, I've unusual. seen it. I've yeah. Seen, oh, oh, yeah. I've seen people do 3D printed type high, basically letters or or characters even, so not even necessarily letters, and then run it through the press as long as it's designed as type high, so they could mix and match it with wood block, lead type and their 3D printed stuff. So they could come up with some fantastic ideas. Yeah, I mean, people do some different things. I mean, we were offering a class for a little while where people printed with Lego blocks. We put the Lego blocks in the, in, you know, made them type high. That's one thing. We, uh, in terms of older methods, we now have a couple of hand presses and our studio director, Chad Johnson, those are, sort of his love in terms of being able to do something that is, there are ways that you can print with a hand press. So as opposed to a Van der Kolk cylinder press where you're rolling the, the way you're pushing the paper through the press along with the cylinder is a different way of coming at the paper. Whereas if you, for a hand press, it's similar in design to what Gutenberg would have used. You would do one printing at a time, but it'll, because you're coming straight down on something, you can do much more nuanced, finer types of printing. But again, it's not a quick production. Well, which leads to something else that like, I would love for the listener to be able to understand. I understand because I did it, <laughs> is the amount of time that it takes because like you talked about like lead type and how time consuming it is to set it up. I've never found the setup uh, as such a bother. My problem was always putting it back. Like, because anytime you set up lead type, every single letter that you put in there, if you're in a good responsible shop, you then have to take the time to then put all those letters back in the, in the correct case and in the correct slot. That's, uh, that's the part that I was, you know, cleaning up bothered. That was so time consuming. Well, it's certainly the setting of the type 
making sure the the spacing and the look of it is correct and 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 what you want and then yeah the the putting back yes you're not alone at because <laughs> it's not just the it's not just the type itself it's all of the spacing that goes in between the in between the type so we actually have volunteers who take pleasure in sorting spacing and to some some degree type but you get to the end of the day and it's like getting the type cleaned put back in its place is is an effort okay but so for people who've never done this before so like give them a, like a, a sense of on average let's say a single sheet of typed paper I mean, polymer plates, of course, very fast because you can just set up an entire sheet and run it very fast. But like, if you're going to do it with lead type, how long would it take to set up, print, and then clean up just one piece of paper? God, I wish I could do a phone a friend right now because <laughs> my studio director would know this and I, I really have no, because I was one of those people that was set my type in my printing class and was like, okay, I'm off to polymer. So I would guess that if you were setting a full page of type, standard sort of like, I would say you were doing a, a broadside, which is a smaller poster of a bigger type. I don't know, probably it's gonna take you in the in the hours to, oh, yeah. to do, to do. Oh, I was expecting more than that. I mean, depending, of course, on how intricate it is and how much text it is. But like, it's a lot. Of, it's a very time consuming process. And then, of course, people at the Center for the Book, it's they're not doing single pages generally. They're doing books, so like they have to do dozens of pages. You know, <laughs> it's it's pretty rare these days that someone is doing a book there. If they're doing something of any length, they're they're doing it with polymer plates. So we've been making an effort to do something that is more along the lines of, of a book. We had donors donate money to purchase fresh type from M&H type, M&H Foundry here in San Francisco. We have a whole set of new type and we're trying to come up with some small book that we can print and, and produce. Maybe a short, like a short, short story so, and something that is not copyrighted. So that is a program that's, that's in development, but that is a, that's a real time commitment. It really is. I mean, it's not just a time commitment, but it's also a, a financial commitment because you're, you're having to, as the artist who's producing something, you're going to have to, you know, if you want to make an edition of, let's say 25, realistically, you're going to have to buy a minimum of probably 35 sheets of whatever paper you want to use because there are going to be mistakes. You're going to get off alignment. You're going to get bad pressure, whatever, like, you know, poor inking, all kinds of stuff. So like, you know, when you like, I remember, cause I did this where I said, Oh, okay. I, I need to make 10 prints of this. And so I bought 10 sheets of paper and I'm why I did that. I don't know other than that I was a student and I was poor, but that was just ludicrous. Like the possibility of getting a hundred percent perfect production on every single one is just crazy. So there's, there's excess, there's waste, there's lots of money that you have to put into the, just the materials of the whole thing of creating it with the hope of it working out beautifully, then potentially you could exhibit it or sell it and, and somehow recoup your money. And it's, it's a huge investment of time and money to go through this yeah. process. It's yeah, it's you sort of want, wonder why anyone would do it. But if you want to see a real a really good story of of someone who did that there's a, just a, a documentary that came out called The Bookmakers and it follows Mark Sergianos Sergianos in that process and you everything from he is casting his own type and then you get to the point where you can pr you print half the book and you have to melt the type back down and recast it to do the rest of the book. So the sort of message of that documentary is how you're not doing this for the money. I mean, I mean, everything I just talked about is not even including the 
artistic inspiration and then the the actual creation of the idea so whether it's some images or whether it's the writing the story so that's all stuff that artists do before they even come to your your location you know by by the act of coming to you it's like okay i've got all the idea and the design done now i'm just going to produce the thing so like there's all this pre-work that's done before people even come to you yeah I mean, the book making process leading up to this, where, you know, you have, you have the bookmakers now who are really creating, doing everything themselves. I mean, it was a fairly specialized thing. You had the casters and you had the typesetters and then you had the, the sewers and you had the binders. You know, everybody had their own focused role to play. So, Indeed. All right. Let's start to whittle end this up here. So like something I'm asking people these days is actually, do you have three artists or bookmakers or, or press people that you think are, are, are inspiring or in desire of more admiration? Oh, I had my answers until that last part. And I was like, oh, I should think. So. Oh, you can change it. You can do it. Three people you like that more you want more people to pay attention to. One person that people should know is Heidi Kyle, H-E-D-I-K-Y-L-E. She was a teacher at, a uh, book arts teacher in Philadelphia. It's retired now, but has is still putting up books. And she's famous for her non-adhesive bindings, but her, her creativity is extraordinary. I think if you're interested in really tapping into the, the really contemporary elements of what's happening in the book art scene these days. Tia Blassingame is now down at Scripps College, Scripps Press, and she is really a leader in terms of supporting the next generation of book artists. And her work itself is worthy, is certainly inspirational and also worthy of people knowing about I think in terms of someone who really started it all, started the whole book arts, artist book scene, Claire Van Vliet. She lives up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. She was the pioneer in this. So I would encourage people to check her out and, and her, her work. So that's three. Great. And the last thing I generally ask is for any advice you can give to Anyone. So whether it's somebody who, like yourself, wanted to move into being a director of a nonprofit or whether it's uh, advice for book artists, it's up to you. I'll speak more to the nonprofit side of things, because I think, as we were discussing before, you know, that making that switch, you know, if you're coming from the for-profit world and going into not nonprofits, you have no idea what you don't know. And there's a lot that you don't know. But I would not, well, I would not let that stop you. I mean, I didn't know that until I was in it. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this isn't what I was, I, what is the, what is all this? I certainly, I'm very happy that I did it. It's just, it's, it's a really, it's, it's not the shift that you think it is. <laughs> it's much more of a shift. It's huge. I started my nonprofit because I loved, it was a community dark room for photography, analog dark room. I did it because I loved the dark room and I wanted to teach it. I wanted to do all that. However, but what I realized by the end of my tenure doing that is, is that I would be a great studio manager or lead professor or like lead instructor or program director or those kinds of things because that's what I'm really good at. Like I can run a dark room. I can teach how to use the dark room fabulously, but to be a director of a nonprofit is a certain kind of person because of all the other things that they have to do that most people in the world just don't even know that they do. Like the amount of, the amount of, sh I, I, I keep saying schmoozing, but it's, it's networking, building networks, building a community, building a tribe, whatever word you want to put to it, the amount of that kind of stuff. And then the, the, the trying to find good board members that will be helpful 
that's my advice actually, is if you're looking to, to make that transition or are thinking about it or getting into nonprofits, serve on a board. Nonprofits need good board members. And that is an excellent way to give back to the organization, really get to know how a nonprofit works. That is what I would advise. It's a good way to start. Yeah. If I had served on a board before being a director, I probably would have done a better job. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great actually. I mean, it's, you really, you learn a lot. Yeah. It's, it's a good way to go. All right. Any last topic that you want to expand on or that we didn't touch that you want to talk about? Uh, I th think the one thing that I didn't, I realized I didn't go into about the, the center and its programs was the vendor fairs that we put on. I didn't really focus on that as part of what we do because I mentioned that our mission is to, to support new work and artists who are producing new work. And so these vendor fairs, we usually, we do a holiday fair. Our Roadwork Street Festival usually has around, you know, 30 to 40 vendors. We've been starting to do something that's more of an artist book fair every other year that includes artist books that are a little more affordable to encourage collectors, because that's really what the artist book scene needs are new collectors. And there's some great stuff out there. So, you know, something our, our first limit was, you know, under a thousand dollars or hopefully under $500 as a starting point. And so, you know, really offering opportunities for artists to sell their work. So I wouldn't, I would just encourage people to look for those types of things and to buy those works that you think are, are interesting. Okay. You just touched on a topic. So let's continue on the collectors. Uh, Yes. Who collects artist books? Like I would imagine, because like if you're gonna have them in your home, you're gonna display them. It's good. You're generally gonna have to have a reasonably large home. So we're talking about generally reasonably well-to-do people, because it's very difficult to present or show off these kinds of things. So like, and and then do they like? Because I'm imagine you know a lot of these collectors. A lot of them are probably mm -hmm. your your patrons and your and your funders and things like this. So like. Are, are, you know, what's the, I guess it's sort of like, what's the demographic of people that collect artist books? As with the general art scene, it, it ranges for, from the type of work that we're talking about. I mean, there's, there's definitely a scene for the lower priced artist book. And there's definitely a mid range of artist book for people who really have become collectors who are not wealthy, who save up their money so that they can buy one of an edition of an artist that they are, are collecting. Okay, so but when, when you're saying mid-range, give me a price range on these. I would say that mid-range is probably in the 500 to a couple thousand dollar book. That's mid-range books? For an artist book, yeah, sure. Okay. That was why our Bookworks vendor fair was really, we wanted artists to be, we wanted them to be up out of the zine range, which would, so we said minimum 50 bucks, but hopefully 500 or under in that range. But it's really, you know, if artists are putting this, this amount of work into something, you're really not going to, I mean, 500 to 750 dollars is really sort of a starting point i'm not actually questioning the quality of the price mm. i'm just su sort of maybe surprised that i guess the last time i looked at artist books they were more probably in like 250 was probably the highest price point i remember seeing but it, it, that was 20 years ago <laughs> when i walk walk around codex the artist book fair yeah, it's thousands. It's thousands of dollars are the starting prices. There are certainly exceptions, but by and large, there, it's it's it, it's a real investment. And yes, it trends toward wealthy wealthy people who can afford to purchase those books. And there is a select group of those, and institutions. But what do people do with them? So, like, you know, some of these collectors personally. So, like, do they put them on display, or are they just like on their bookshelf? It, you know, that that is one challenge of artist books is how to display them 
what I've seen mostly is people will have them. Usually, they would have, if they're a big collector, would have them in storage somewhere. And then they would either rotate, bring them out to show off or to show to people, or they would rotate their home displays with obviously some, some, some of them would be permanent. That's what I've seen is that you kind of rotate things. They also lend them out to organizations like the Center for the Book for their exhibitions. Well, I mean, because it's kind of hard because it's still a technically a work on paper. So it has to be kept rather in a, in a fragile uh, way, you know, so it's not like a marble sculpture that like literally you could just put out in, in the elements and it will be fine. I mean, this is, these are very fragile, delicate things generally. I'm not enough of a, of a knowledgeable about visual arts and also of about, about restoration, but they can be particularly sensitive to light. And humidity. Humidity. Yeah, we have that issue, especially if you're, if it's a binding and you're opening and closing it and, you know, you have humidity issues and it cracks or, you know, you get some fading from sunlight. So, yeah, it's a constant challenge. But, yeah, I think that, I think that for the most part, that's one reason to keep a chunk of them away out of circulation in your home for a while. But I was also going to say that rare books collections at, at university libraries are major collectors of artists' books. And in fact, if you go like here, the, the Bancroft Library over in Berkeley has an amazing collection and you can go see see what they have there. And also like the San Francisco Public Library, you know, they're all over. You can see some of some of the work that that artists have have done. And okay, are the oh, that's an interesting question. So, like, I'll call those institutional places. Uh, are yeah. these relationships that you build, or do the individual artists build these relationships? We're as an organization trying to build up those relationships, but for the most part, it's either the direct relationship with the artist, or it's through something like the Codex Fair. We started to do exhibition, full exhibition catalogs back in, well, more regularly back in 2012, we'd done them, and this was before my time, but we'd done them for other shows, but not as consistently and with a consistent look. But the idea was that when we wanted to produce these catalogs, but also, and they're on sale at our website, to really capture the work that's out there and that institutions have started to collect these catalogs as an archive of not so much the exhibition, but the work that's out there and that's being produced. So that actually feels good that we're kind of contributing to at least, you know, having some record of the, of the work. Marvelous. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's a great scene. I mean, I tell you that there's probably no other scene that has so many different currents passing through it and collaborating and artists working together to produce things. And... Well, every artist, no matter what medium they sort of primarily work in, wants to produce a book like we all yeah. do. So like the idea of making a, you know, handcrafted, hand produced kind of a version, even so even if they make a mass produced version of a book to be able to make a, a unique sort of limited edition handcrafted thing, th that's everybody's dream if we can afford mm. to do it. Yeah, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a lot. I think it's a lot of people's. Yeah. One last thing I want to want to say this is that I came in, this jumps back to your very first question, coming from coming from finance and entering the nonprofit world. I think in my my case, I did not come in as a book artist. And certainly for the makeup of the or the people involved at the center, it was really useful to have someone that really didn't have any artistic skin in the game. Sorry to use a sports reference there. But really, I was able to kind of allow people to be creative and do what they wanted to do and not get in the way 
of that and really work on running the organization. So, you know, that it's different cultures at different organizations and that isn't always, you know, the, the best thing. But I think just because you yourself are not an artist, but you've got the skills that would support an organization does not mean that you can't come in and be successful running an arts organization. Fabulous way to end this. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Matt. This is fun. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and learned as much as I did. If you like the podcast, we would appreciate a five-star rating and a nice comment would be greatly appreciated. Please also tell your friends to listen and subscribe. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If there is someone that you admire or respect in the art world that you want to hear me have a conversation with, please send me a message through Instagram and I'll do my best to get them as a guest. Additionally, if you have any specific questions for the guests, like you want to know how to write an artist statement, which of course I always want to know, or how to deal with creative block, or if you want to learn how to get your work into MoMA, send me those questions and I'll ask future guests on your behalf. In the near future, we'll be starting a newsletter, so please be sure to sign up at our website, wisefoolpod.com. No matter what you're doing right now, try to have fun.